Not your, your home is a happy and warm place to be or a, or a cooler place to be. You're building. You're making meals. You're, you're cleaning. You're trying to raise well-behaved, well-mannered kids. You are building. Or maybe you're in here today and you're the breadwinner of your home or one of the breadwinners of your home. You're going out every day working hard trying to make a name for yourself or for the company that you work for. All those things, working hard, those things are good. But if we're trying to do those things on our own, it's not going to be a very good house. The best, the best you and I will ever get built on our own is just a leaky shack halfway falling apart. And I don't want a shack that I can build. I want the house that he alone can build. Amen? When I try to build the house, when I start to think that I'm in control, and when I stop relying on the Lord for my strength, when I stop seeking him out in daily guidance and counsel, things do not go well. I just don't. I feel like I'm a pretty hard worker. Most of my days start really early. I work part-time for the church, full-time in ministry, and full-time in my home. And I love every single bit of all of it. I truly do. I cannot believe I get to live life like this. But when I start to do those things in my own strength, I start to do exactly what these verses say that we will do. And I'd be willing to bet I'm not the only one in here who does it. So I just want to start out this morning by taking a moment to examine the three things that these verses say that we will do if we start trying to build the house ourselves. So we're going to start this way. If we try to build the house ourselves, number one, we labor in vain. We labor in vain. When I'm building the house, I build it for myself. I build it for myself. I build it according to what I think will make me the most happy. I build it according to what I think will make me look the best to everyone else. I build it according to what I think will give me the most gain. But all that is vanity. It's vanity. It does not provide me with one single bit of satisfaction. King Solomon, who's believed to have written written this psalm, is also believed to have written the book of Ecclesiastes. I don't know if you've ever read, read it before, but it is an interesting book. And he starts off the book of Ecclesiastes in kind of a, what seems like on the surface, a depressing way. He says this, he says, vanity, it's all vanity. Some, some translations say meaningless, it's all meaningless. What does man gain by all his toil under the sun? That's how he starts it out. That makes you want to read it, right? That's how it starts out. This was the richest and wisest man But it was all meaningless to him. And left to my own choices, I would build my house the exact same meaningless way. It would all be for nothing. Because our house, it's not supposed to be about us. It's not. About a year ago, the Lord, he started pressing on mine and Matt's hearts that um, he wanted us to build an addition to our house. Not our actual physical house, but the house that the Lord is building. He wanted to add an addition to it, and that addition was going to be called foster care. And this addition um, caught me off guard because I wouldn't expect Matt to be like, all right, yeah. Um, But he kind of was the one who brought it up initially, and we began to pray about it and to walk in that direction, and we got approved, and that's a long, lengthy process. And then about seven months ago, we took in the most precious little boy. He was 18 months old. He's now two months old. And, and you all have probably seen him running around. You all have loved him so well. Thank you for that. But we have spent the last seven months loving him, caring for him, feeding him, teaching him, bathing him, playing with him. And it has been such a blessing. But these seven months, man, it's been a big part of our mindset. Thursday. I was in the office working on this message, and often as the Lord works, I get a call that it is now time to learn to let him go. In just a couple short weeks, he will be um, reunited with his family. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Reunification is always the goal, and they have worked really hard to get their son back, so praise the Lord. But as I'm sitting there, I'm like, Lord, 
why build the house this way? Why build this addition onto our home? Because I don't feel any different. Clearly by my attitude right now, I didn't learn a whole lot. I don't feel more like Jesus right now. Like I knew it was going to hurt and it hurts. So why, why, why build the house this way? And my husband, he reminded me because so often he is the voice of the Lord to me. He reminded me that the house is not about us. The house was never supposed to be about us. He didn't add on this addition to our house just for us. Now I'm sure I will look back and see how the Lord changed my heart and what I learned through this. But it's not just about us. It was about a little two-year-old boy needing a home for seven months where he had every need taken care of, where he didn't have to worry about a thing, where he would learn for the first time what it meant to be a part of a church family, where he would hear every single day in a song that Jesus loves him. The house isn't about us. And although there is pain from this addition to our house, when we build the house for ourselves, it is in vain. But when we build it for the glory of the Lord, when we build it for others, it is not in vain. It was not meaningless. And I will be able to look back on this and see that the Lord did not build it in vain. The house is not about us. When we try to build the house ourselves, we labor in vain. Number two, when we try to build the house ourselves, we also lie awake in vain. Why do we lie awake? Because we're worried all the time. We're worried all the time. We're like watchmen staying awake at night. We can't really do anything about all the things that we are worried about, but we just stay up and we worry about them anyways, right? Because there is no security when we build the house ourselves. There's no security in that. It's just a shack after all. So honestly, when we build the house ourselves, we're probably worried for good reason because we know that a blow here or there is gonna be catastrophic because the house is weak. If we are building it ourselves, it's just a shack. So we lie awake in vain because we know it's coming. That is what it's like when we build the house ourselves. Lastly, number three, when we build the house ourselves, we eat the bread of anxious toil. Y'all ever had a bite of that? The bread of anxious toil I have. You know what it tastes like? It tastes like um, sun up to sun down, just frantically chasing after the next task. Doing our best to hold up the roof of that house for fear that it's going to come crashing down on us. There's little joy or calmness as we work. When we're building the house ourselves, our days are full of anxiety and our work is done in an anxious frenzy. You ever had a bite of that? I know I have. Now those three things, working in vain, lying awake in vain, and eating the bread of anxious toil, that is what happens. That is what these verses tell us will happen when we try to build the house ourselves. But I've got good news. I've got such good news. You don't have to build the house yourself. I do not have to build the house myself. Praise God. Matt doesn't have to build the house himself. We weren't meant to do it. Do you know how much joy and freedom there is in realizing you don't have to build the house yourself? You know, one of the reasons why I said earlier that my husband is the head of my home and I wouldn't have it any other way, well, one of the many reasons is because... I don't want that kind of pressure. I don't want that kind of pressure. If something goes wrong, I want to be like, uh, Lord, you know. I don't want that kind of pressure. When we realize that we don't have to build the house ourselves, we get to live with a lot less pressure. You were not created to build the house. I wasn't created to build the house. We aren't made to do it. Instead, we have an expert builder. We have an expert builder, the greatest builder of all time, the master architect. He has the design plan of a lifetime right there at our disposal. He truly does. Those aren't cheap words. He really, really does. Yet too often, I think we come to him with our little scribbles drawn up on a paper napkin, and we give it to him, and we're like, Lord, this is what I want. This is it right here. This is what I want. I know you can't see this, so you'll just have to take my word for it. But um, my little Allie June, she's eight. She um, drew her dream house on this paper napkin. And let me tell you, she thought about it. 
Like this, she understood the assignment. She thought about it. She thought about it, and she took her time, and she worked hard, and she drew up her dream house, much like we think about it, right? Like we think about it. When we give our plans to the Lord, it's not haphazardly. We've thought about it. We know what we think we want. We know what we think is best, and that's why he gave it to me. It was smart. I know my Allie June, and I know the desires of her heart, so the first thing I did was smile. I want you to hear that. But then the second thing I did was I looked at it, and I'm like, oh, okay. And I saw some things that would eventually be glaring issues for Allie June. You see, right now she's got her house. It's a big house. It's a pretty house. But it's in the center of all these things that are really important to Allie June. She's got a trampoline over here. She's got a pool with, like, all these outdoor water park things over here. She's got a bike path that goes, like, around the whole front and side of the house. She has a playground, and she has a fire pit in the back. It's all around the house, all the things that are important to Allie June. But I'm looking at this, and I'm like, mm, okay, this is good. But, but she doesn't have any room for a driveway, you know? And she doesn't have a garage. So if Allie June achieves this dream house that she thinks is the cream of the crop, the best that she's ever going to get, she's going to be parking a long way away to walk to this house every day. From my perspective, I can see that there's some glaring issues with her dream house, with her plans. And it makes me smile because I know her heart, but I also have a higher perspective than hers. What is important to her right now, what is in her perspective as being the most important thing, I know better. I know that one day she's going to want a driveway. I know that one day she's going to want more than two windows in her house. But right now, windows and a driveway are not that important. And sometimes, I think it's just like this. We come to the Lord with our plans and we're like, this is it. This is it, Lord. This is what I want. And sometimes I think he smiles because he loves us. Y'all, he loves you, and he knows the desire of your heart. He knows how hard you thought about it and how you're not necessarily wanting to do something wrong. But, but he looks at it, and he sees some glaring issues. And so he's like, oh, you can do that. You, you can get that shack you've dreamed up standing. And sometimes I think he's even like, I'll even give you the grace to survive the build of it, but it's not going to be pretty. It is not going to be pretty or you can put those paper napkin plans in my hand. And then he's like, you can trade them in for something else. Because he has plans too. He has plans that are, that are so much better than your plans. He has plans too. And he's like, you can, you can trade them in. And you can follow my lead. And you and I together, we can build something that will withstand any rain. Something that will withstand any wind. Something that will actually satisfy the emptiness of your soul. And do you want to know the best part that he offers us? Throughout the whole entire process, he assures us that he will give us rest. He will give us rest, verse number two, for he gives to his beloved sleep, even throughout the build. Trade him in. Y'all, trade them in. Ask yourself today, who is building my house? This church is also a house. It's also a house. I do not say this lightly. I have attended church my entire life, but I have never been a part of a church like this. I have never been a part of a church that is in such a healthy place. Do you know what it's like to say that, being kind of in a leadership role where you know the ins and outs of everything? I've never been a part of a church that is in such a healthy place where unity and love cover the congregation like a blanket, where service and, and generosity are just a natural outflowing of the church body. It's insane. I've never been a part of anything like that. And that's because the Lord is building this house. I didn't ask Dallas' permission to share this story because he would have said no. Um, so in this instance, I think it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. But um, around the time when Dallas was first hired, he was getting a tour of our church's office space, which is actually located above Foster Sons in Jonesboro. They are so gracious and generous to let us use that office space. And Dallas was getting the tour up there. 
And there is one office up there that is significantly larger than all of the other offices. Um, and the rest of us who work up there, we're just part-time. We just work part-time, and we've already taken the smaller offices anyways. So it was easily assumed that the, the largest top dog head honcho office was going to go to Dallas, right? This was a no-brainer. It was just understood that he was going to move into this office. Well, some days passed by, and um, Dallas hasn't moved into the head honcho office. Instead, He's moved into this smaller, more oddly shaped office. And he's turned the largest office into a space for prayer. It's a prayer room now because he wanted the largest space in our office to be be focused and centered around the Lord and on prayer for our church body as a whole and our church members as individuals. He wanted our office to be founded on that instead of founded on him. And so now we can go in there and we can, we can pray for the needs. And we, there's a whiteboard in there, y'all. There's a whiteboard in there with some of your names on it. And we add to it and we take away as the Lord answers prayers. And now, because of his decision, we all get to go into that prayer room in an office that is founded on and centered around prayer. And we get to pray. And it's such a beautiful, wonderful place to come in to get to work there. Work. All that... Because Dallas knew who was going to build this house. And he knew that it wasn't him. I'm so thankful the Lord sent us someone who knew that it wasn't himself. It is the Lord who builds this house. And no offense to Dallas, but I'm glad because his paper napkin plans would have never brought us to where we are today. Amen. Amen. It is the Lord who builds this house and it is the Lord who will continue building it. But I'm going to ask you again, who's building your house? Maybe you're in here today and it's hard for you to answer that question. You're like, well, some days I feel like I'm letting the Lord build my house. And then some days I'm taking the reins myself and moving forward. I mean, I feel you. I feel you on that. I know what it's like to live that way where you're trying, but then you can't quite give them control. So you take it back again. And that just leaves you anxious and kind of exhausted, right? If that's you, the final thing that I want to tell you this morning as our worship team comes back up, I want to leave you with four things that you can do to be sure that it is the Lord who is building your house and not yourself. You can come. Four quick things you can do to be sure that the Lord is the one building your house. Number one, you got to have the right foundation, right? you got to have the right foundation. You have to have a relationship with Jesus. If you're in here today and you're really not sure, if you have one of those, come find me, come find Dallas or the elders. We'd be happy to make sure that you know whether or not you have a relationship with Jesus. But maybe you do. Maybe you do have a relationship with Jesus and you're still like, I don't know if it's me or if it's him, who's in control here. Man, I would tell you this. This would be my advice. Fortify the foundation. Fortify the foundation. You have to maintain closeness. You have to maintain that relationship just like you have to do any other relationship you have. Maintain that closeness with him. Draw near to him. If the only time you hear from him and that he hears from you is when you are inside of these four walls, it's going to be really hard for you to trust him enough to let him build your house. Have the right foundation. Number two, let him show you which way to go. Let him show you which way to go. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. This is a common verse. Listen to it with new ears right now, like you've never heard it before. This is something I pray over my husband almost every week, or sometimes more than once a week. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on what you, you think is best. Instead, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge him, and he's gonna direct your path. Ask him which way to go. Don't just go with your gut. Take the time to stop and ask him, and then trust him enough to follow his lead. Number three, work hard. Work hard. We live in this culture right now that tries to belittle working hard, but Colossians 3.23 says this. It says, whatever you do, work at it with your whole heart as though you're working for the Lord and not for human masters. Be willing to work hard. Whatever it is that the Lord has for you, be willing to work hard at it. Not for your own glory, but for his. And I'm telling you, that is so much more satisfying. And then lastly, number four, rest up. Rest up. Work hard when it's time to work hard, and then rest up when it's time to rest up. 
because he gives to his beloved sleep. And you can be sure, this is how you check yourself, you can be sure that he is the one who is building your house when you are able to rest throughout the building process. This list is not exhaustive, but it's a pretty good place to start. If you're here this morning and and you're tired of laboring in vain and laying awake at night and eating the bread of anxious toil, man, trade it in. Trade it in. Life is too short to live like that. Trade it in. Just like our office is centered around this place too, it's a place of prayer this morning. I talked about my dad, about how when he was a kid, he would often kneel beside his bed at night. And I, I wondered many times as a kid, like, why does he do that? Like, doesn't he realize you can pray sitting however you want? You don't have to pray kneeling down. But I want you to notice something about that posture. As we get on our knees at an altar like this, and as we bow our heads, that is a natural posture of humility, right? It's really hard to come before the Lord on your knees with your head bowed and say, this is how I want it. This is what I want. Now, when we take that natural posture of humility, our heart wants to follow suit. And it becomes a lot more like, Lord, however you want to build it, just build it. Do it for your glory, Lord, and not for my glory. However you want it done, I'm okay with that, Lord. Just help me to trust you. Give me rest throughout the building process. If you need to come and ask him to do that this morning, you can. The final song that we're going to sing this morning is one of my favorites. It's called Worthy of It All. And I love this song because it comes straight from Revelation chapter 4. One day, we are going to stand before the throne of God. And we are going to see that however he asked us to build the house, whatever work he wanted us to put in, whatever heartache it may have brought our way, we will see and we will be 100% confident that he is worthy of it all. Amen? Amen? You all can stand. If you need to pray, you can do that. But let's praise him for that this morning.